conversion. Conversion. If you read, if you read Ezekiel, you find turn unto the Lord with all your heart. In Jeremiah, turn unto the Lord with all your heart. And as you read uh, Jonah, all those Ninevites, they turned, they repented, they turned unto the Lord. It, it's the expression of conversion and salvation. And when we pray in chapter 2, asking of the Lord, that the Lord will give to Christ, his only begotten son, the heathen for his inheritance. Here is the answer to the prayer. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. That's the answer to the prayer. We're going to pray. And the Lord will turn people unto himself in Jesus' name. As we're having this prevailing prayer for a great harvest, there are three areas of the prayer. Number one, praying for the salvation of sinners. Praying for the salvation of sinners. Number two, praying for the sanctification of saints. Praying for the sanctification of saints. Number three, praying for the steadfastness of his servants. Number one, you are praying for the sinners. Number two, you are praying for the saints. Number three, you are praying for the servants. Because all those things come together as we are praying for a great harvest of souls into the kingdom. As we talk about praying for the salvation of sinners, and let's look at Isaiah chapter 66 verse 8. Isaiah chapter 66 verse 8. Who has heard such a theme? Who are seeing such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. As soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. It's talking about traveling in prayer. In fact, when it talks about the heart-rendering prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ, it uses that word travail, travail, traveling for souls. As the church experienced that, thinking about the sinners and thinking about digging them up out of the pit in which they are, in which they find themselves. Bringing them to himself. Look at Isaiah chapter 53 verse 11. Isaiah 53 verse 11. He shall see the travail of his soul. And shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. The Lord in that verse talking about justification by faith. How does that happen? Because of the travail of his soul. And if the body of Christ will join with the head, that is with Christ, and they see how to travail, how to pray, prevailing prayer, and then taking all these souls, those ones around us will take them by name. And those ones in the various cities will take them by the names of their cities. And then we really, really pray. You'll find that many will be softened. That many will be drawn. They'll be drawn to the side of the Lord. Number one, I told you in that section is praying for the salvation of sinners. Number two, praying for the sanctification of the saints. Praying for the sanctification of the saints. And you'll see the connection between that and the soul winning. The connection between that and the harvesting of souls into the kingdom. Let's look at John chapter 17. John chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 14. I have given them thy word. The them there is referring to the disciples. The believers. Rejoice not because you cast out devils. But rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Their sins were forgiven. They were saved. They were the people of God. Their names were written in the book of life. And Jesus said, I have given them thy word. And the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. These are believers like you and I. Like those of us who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. But that thou shouldest keep them from the, from the evil. 
they are not of the world even as i'm not of the world obviously they are they were saved they were born again they were children of god and jesus knew them now he said in verse 17 sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth christ was praying for the sanctification of the believers the sanctification of the saints why because now you come to verse 18 as thou hast sent me into the world even so have i sent them into the world you see the connection between verse 17 and verse 18 sanctify them and then when they are sanctified i send them into the world as you have sent me into the world why do we need sanctification before we can go and evangelize before sanctification you you, you know the story of the disciples Peter wants to, you know, be the chief among all the rest of the people. And James and John, one wants to sit on this side. And on the other side, they were seeking their own position seeking, place seeking. Was a major sin for them. And the people perishing was not anything, anything to them. Lord, we are forsaking all. What shall we have? What's our reward? What's our gain? That was the most important thing to them at that time. And then they questioned among themselves, who should be the greatest in the kingdom? That was the greatest thing to them. The uppermost thing in their heart. And the Lord said, O oh Lord, my Father, sanctify them. Take all this place-seeking, position-seeking, self-centeredness, selfishness away from them. Sanctify them. And when they are sanctified, I'm sending them to the world, even as you have sent me unto the world. As we pray for the salvation of sinners, we're praying for the sanctification of the saints, so that we'll be able, by the grace of God, to have this in our hearts, in our life, that the most important is not the position I hold, it's not the title I hold, it's not whether I am, you know, my opinion is what, you know, is uppermost. You know, sometimes the church comes together and we're discussing plan for evangelization, the strategy to evangelize. And then maybe brother A gives a suggestion. I will say, no, we're not going with that yet. And then brother B go, comes with a suggestion. And everybody knows that what Brother B is saying is what we should do. But Brother A is offended. And because it's of, they will not take my opinion, my idea, my suggestion, nothing else will work. Except everybody comes back to me and does what I want. The sinners will perish if I'm not on the throne. The sinners can go to hell if the people don't put me on my seat. You see, that's why we need sanctification. The little you and the big I, when that is cancelled, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Then after that sanctification, as the Father has sent me into the world, even so send I them into the world. In First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. He will do it. You know, it will not be a wonderful thing in a church when there's no argument, when there's no personal desire, where there's no personal ambition, where there's no putting down of the other fellow so I can come up, where there's no carnality and no jealousy, where there's no carnal comparison, where we're not interested in what happens to us individually, and we're not interested whose name is on the, on the board, whose name is on the list. All we want is the salvation of souls, the sanctification. When I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live is not a personal, selfish, private thing. The life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And all that matters to me, let souls be saved. Whoever is doing it, and whatever means is being used, let it be done. Whatever I lose, whatever I gain, let souls be saved. That's sanctification. That's why Paul the Apostle prayed for the Thessalonian believers. And he said, I'm praying for you. 
that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, faithfully see, who has called you, he will do it. Number one, praying for the salvation of sinners. Number two, praying for the sanctification of the saints. Number three, praying for the steadfastness of his servants. The steadfastness of his servants. That as the Lord is telling us, we pray for the sinners to be saved, to bring in a great harvest. We need to pray for the ministers of God. Not only your own minister, but all the ministers of God that will be steadfast will be stable in the things of the Lord. That there will be nothing to discourage us who are, the, who are the servants of the Lord that will just keep on evangelizing without looking back. We're told in Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, Paul the Apostle said, pray for me, pray for me. Uh, you know, sometimes, uh, can you look up here for a moment? I've been studying, of course I study many things, but I study the prayers in the Bible. And any time that Paul the Apostle said, pray for me, he said that in Romans chapter 15. Then he said that in this Ephesians chapter 6, pray for me. And I'm wondering, what were they to pray for? Look at the content of the prayer. And then every time Paul the Apostle says, Philippians, I'm praying for you. Look at the content of the prayer. And Ephesians believers, I kneel down before the Father. I'm praying for you. Look at the content of the prayer. And then he goes on in First Timothy, he's praying. How do we pray? How do we pray for the saints? How do we pray for the ministers? As you look at the contents of the prayer, you might find out that the content of our praying is way behind and below the content of the prayer in the Bible. Very essential, very important, that we're upgrading the level of our praying. And we're saying, looks like we've been missing it for a long time. This is what to pray for. And this is how to pray. This is the kind of prayer that interests the Almighty God. Look at the prayer now in verse 19. Pray for me. That utterance may be given unto me. What a prayer. That utterance may be given unto me. Paul, can we pray for you that all this buffeting of the devil, everything will stop. Don't worry about that. That just keeps me humble. Can we pray for you that all the shipwreck and you know all the difficulties and persecutions and all these Jews running after you? Can we pray that persecutions will stop? Don't worry about that. You know, God will do what he wants to do in spite of all those persecutions. What I need is this. Pray for me. That utterance may be given unto me and that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. So it's not the kind of prayer I need. That's the kind of prayer we should be praying for the ministers of God. Whatever is happening to them, whatever challenges they have, how can you pray that you know, a minister will never have any opposition? Then it's, never, it's not a minister like Christ anymore. Christ had opposition, had persecution. Had mis All those people misunderstood him. Don't you pray those kinds of useless prayers. Persecution develops the believer, develops even the ministers of God. But pray for us that we'll be able to open our mouths boldly and declare the mystery of the gospel in verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, and that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. That's the kind of prayer he wants us to pray. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we're reading from verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us. What are we praying for, Paul? I'll tell you that the word of the Lord may have free cause. That's a prayer. That's a prayer. We're praying so that there'll be evangelization, harvesting of souls into the kingdom. And then Paul, the apostle, says, pray for me. And in praying for Paul, you're praying for all the other servants of God that the word of the Lord may have free cause and may be glorified even as it is in you. If we actually pray for the lost and we concentrate praying aright, what result are we going to have? Acts of the Apostles chapter 6. Acts of the Apostles chapter 6. We're reading from verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer 
and to the ministry of the word. Do you see those two things there? Number one, we'll give ourselves, we'll addict ourselves, we'll commit ourselves to the ministry of prayer, unto prayer. And then it says to the ministry of the word. Not preaching without praying. Not praying without preaching either. We're preaching, we're praying, we're praying, we're preaching. What's the result? Verse 7. In verse 7 it says, And the word of the Lord increased. And the word of the Lord increased. And it says, And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. As we pray, that's going to be our experience. Many more people are going to come to know the Lord, and you will know the Lord through us in Jesus' name. Number one is prevailing prayer. Number two is persuasive preaching. Persuasive preaching for a great harvest. Now you have seen that, as uh, the apostles said, we'll commit ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The result comes out immediately in that verse 7. A great number of uh, the priests were even converted unto the Lord. That means preaching is very important. But it's not just preaching. There are many kinds of preaching. Preaching. Persuasive preaching. When you preach, you are trying to draw people to a verdict, a decision. You are presenting something that needs an answer. You are not just giving out information. You are not just giving out instruction. And then you say, I've done my part. It doesn't really matter what you think about it, what you do with that. I have done, no, it's not so. When you're preaching the gospel to our best souls into the kingdom, you want the people you're preaching to, to take a decision. And you don't say what you want to say, you say what needs to be said. And then you don't use your own language, the language you understand. You know, sometimes you are talking to somebody else, and uh, you understand yourself. But the person you are talking to, out of, you know, politeness, just nods the head. Mm -hmm, I hear you. That's all right. No, that's okay. And then, but if you were to have a feedback and you were to say, what did I say? What do you understand by what I said? You'll be surprised what some of those people say. We must try so that they understand us. Because you are presenting the gospel, you are not just you are not presenting morals. You know, sometimes you you are talking to somebody, and all you say, all you say is good, but it's just morality. You know, we shouldn't do this, we shouldn't do that, we shouldn't. Do, that's good. I know we shouldn't, but that's not the gospel. You are preaching the gospel. You are not preaching morals. You are not out to give moral education to people. How to turn over a new leaf. How to become a better person, become a better father, how to relate with people. Let the psychologists do that. But you, you are out to present the gospel. And you need to know what that gospel is. And then you need to have a response, a decision on that gospel. Persuasive preaching for a harvest, a great harvest. In First Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're looking at verse 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You want them to believe. 